Hi, everybody. So Green Enterprise is a weekly series dedicated to the latest in cannabis and in honor of Women's History Month. Andrew has been so gracious to let Britt and I host. I'm Jessica Couch, the co-founder of Federal Road Agency. And I'm Brittany Hicks, the other co-founder. And today we have Vickiana Reyes joining us from Medgar Evers College. Hi, Vickiana. Thank you for being here. Hello. So Vickiana, can you give us a little bit about your background before entering into the cannabis space and let people know where you're coming from? So I am born and bred in Brooklyn and I have been a software engineer for almost two decades. I won't give the exact number, refuse to give away the age, um, JK. And uh, aside from that, I'm um, an NSF grant recipient for different technologies I've created. Um, NSF meaning National Science Foundation. I'm also a scientist, a researcher, um, currently transitioning into the MD PhD sector. Uh, for cannabis medicinal research. That's really dope. And I'm sure a lot of people are gonna wonder as a woman in STEM, what brought you into the cannabis space specifically? Well, I can say cannabis has always been part of my life mm -hmm. since college. Um, and in regards to the industry, actually, um, as someone who's been in corporate America for a while, seeing a lack of BIPOC constituents is something that is very, important to address for me personally. And um, uh, as I was doing my post baccalaureate at Meckers, being uh, a software engineer person myself uh, in the corporate sector, I realized that the cannabis industry is just like any other industry. But what was really surprising and disappointing was the lack of BIPOC constituents in the cannabis industry throughout the states that's already becoming structuralized. And so I would think that it would be inappropriate for so many BIPOC constituents who have been affected by the war drugs to not be taking part um, in a strong way throughout this entire industrial commercialization of it. Absolutely. So let's get straight into that because I feel like that a lot of people who maybe aren't in can don't see that there's kind of two sides of the spectrum, right? And there's this market called the legacy market. And for people who aren't familiar with that, could you tell us exactly what the legacy market is? And then talk to us about some of the work that you've done in that section. Sure. So the legacy market has unfortunately stigmas around it, but some people may know it as uh, those pioneers who basically built the cannabis industry on their back without any support from state or federal policy. Um, some may think of them as um, industry leaders who provide um, patients with the medicinal plant at times of um, non-support leg legislatively from, from their government. I think of them as the best, the brightest, the most upcoming current cultivators, extractors, breeders, and pheno hunters worldwide that should operate on a federally and or state regulated platform because they've been doing it already and are supreme at it. So they're basically the best at this because they've been doing it even though they didn't have quote unquote legislative permission wherever they operated. Got it, okay. So for anyone that's following along with what we're discussing around the legacy market, um, these are owners, operators, entrepreneurs who have operated in the space predating the legalization of cannabis in whatever states they um, reside. And so Vickiana, in your capacity at Medgar Evers College, you're really leading initiatives to drive education, um, and as a part of that, you conducted a study that we got to hear some of the results of in Albany. So I'd love for you to share with our viewers um, some of the research that you've conducted and what you learned about these entrepreneurs and the misconceptions um, that you're dispelling through that research, because it's really dope. Awesome, thank you. At MEC, with the task force team, we've been working for about two and a half years voluntarily on putting together what is now 
the cannabis degree minor at Mecca Evers. In tandem to that, I took upon myself with some other constituents to do a cross-sectional study of legacy business owners and participants throughout Brooklyn, Bronx, Manhattan, and Queens. Unfortunately, I did not get to Staten Island. My apologies to the borough. <laughs> and so the, um, the purpose of sampling size was about 81 legacy business participants throughout these boroughs. And we basically collected data at the interviewee's desired place of interview. Um, the setting was specifically chosen by the interviewee so that they were most comfortable. Now, one thing that I want to say is that having Black and Brown researchers themselves assisted in bridging extreme cultural divides and lowering defensive responses within these interviewees when we had conducted a lot of these questionnaires. And so these business owners felt that the researchers as well had understood similar or lived similar experiences in terms of um, the heavy weight of unfortunate policy development in the state. Mm -hmm. And I say that because I really want to make sure that BIPOC members understand that we need a lot, a lot of Black and Brown researchers out there really trying to uncover the depth of what's going on in our communities because our communities already trust us. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is something that we should very responsibly take on and try to help in. Aside from that, sorry, I digress. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we reviewed the feedback from these businesses and we conducted SWOT analysis. So we were able to check out the strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that they face on a business operational level. We also assess them for their adaptive capacity and see what would be needed in terms of transition to this new world of commercialization. But one of the most important tools was the ERT tool, which is the experiential race testimony tool. Mm. This tool is usually used um, in health settings by training residents um, oh. when they have to explore how communities of color are affected. Usually their, their, their um, relationship with communities of color because they may not be from that community are based on statistics. So they are not as empathetic or they're not able to relate with these communities when they're treating them. And so doctors have to be able to fully engage with their patients. And so they use ERT. Mm -hmm. um, so we use that and we were able to gather a lot of testimony from these legacy constituents. And we discovered amazing things. These legacy constituents are already executing on the triple bottom line theory, which um, focuses on making sure that you check off not only a profit, but also the people checkbox and the planet. It's very hard to find businesses to date throughout the 52 states that are checking off these three boxes. Um, there are rarely any blue chip companies, which are considered one of the most expensive stocks and sustainable in the states that check off all three regularly. And so this is very important because these businesses are already amazing examples of business sustainability and should be even setting the standards for others when you remove the stigma of them being legacy, quote unquote. I think that, thank you for that. And I think that this industry is so unique because of the existence of the legacy market and there's already a way of doing business. And as we kind of legalize, I think there is a threat that could disrupt the legacy market and what has been established. And it could create what could be a negative um, result through capitalism, right? So if we try to remove the legacy people from this industry, you know, what could be some of the negative results and how can we mitigate bringing legacy into the legal side and bringing them into policy, but also not sharking them and um, trying to change what already exists in cannabis? So one of the threats of not including them would be a threat to the sustainability of the legal New York market. Right. Um, you've seen in other states that legacies, when they're not included properly, the regulated market fails. And so if policy uh, creators, government constituents are really interested in making sure that New York State is a sustainable regulated market, they must do the best that they can to include legacy. Um, 
because like I said, they're already checking off the TBL, the three points. And so that means they will continue to be sustainable, whether they're at into the regulated market or not, mm -hmm. right? Because they've been doing this for years. So it is in the best interest of government to include them if government wants the regulated industry to foster. Now, another thing is reg um, legacy constituents are already, they already encompass the 20, um, the learning, experiential learning aspects that usually are lost in transition when you are receiving passive um, in classroom education because mm -hmm. you can learn something but then when you have to apply it especially in a business setting there is very different skills that are needed and so they're already doing that so they would by bringing them in you make the regulated market now better and more competitive because you have people who are quote unquote already pros coming into this industry mm -hmm. and so your other question jessica was how did I answer that or was there what, another part of that that you asked? I think the twofold part of my question, I believe you answered it. Um, it was just mainly about, like you said, what was the threat of not combining these two industries in a way that's helpful. And I think um, the sustainability part is super important. I do have another question and then I'll throw it to Britt. For people who aren't familiar with all the great things that cannabis does, and you know, you have these policymakers that could be out of touch with the reality of cannabis, how do we bring them in so that they understand the opportunity, how important it is to protect this legacy market, and like the numbers that you've collected, making those things relevant? Well, the cross-sectional data that we did are going to be published in an academic journal, but that takes time, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I would think that it is important for to gather these policy members and give them this information. Um, I'm available to do that. I believe in April, um, there's gonna be caucus week in Albany and I would be happy to provide this data specific information because now this is data specific, right? Like this is not just assumptions mm -hmm. and so if policymakers are open, I, I and other academicians, the researchers are available to provide that information. Love that. Thank you, Vicky, for sharing that research. Um, I just want to regurgitate back a few things I heard to make that I'm digesting it correctly. So it sounds like a lot of these um, entrepreneurs that have been operating in the legacy market and to the point that you made have built the legacy industry um, across the country, but specifically in New York state where you conducted this research, um, they're already operating with this triple bottom line theory that for anyone who's not familiar with blue chip stocks or blue chip companies, we're talking about the apples, the Googles, um, like the big tech stocks of the world who are highly profitable. Um, they're already competing at, at a strategic place with these companies. But then in addition to that, as we see legalization happening, the threat that we'll see evolve is um, a loss of talent from the legalized industry, but also um, a, a challenge to the competitive advantage, right, of like supply and demand. So I think one of the biggest impacts we've seen in the state of California is that legalized cannabis distribution just cannot compete with the legacy market um, based on the tax implications and just other challenges of operating their business. And so can you talk to us a little bit about, from an education perspective, thinking about some of the events that you have coming up in New York to educate our community and really um, start to market the cannabis um, the cannabis degree program at Mega Evers College. I'd love to just hear a little bit more about the program. I know there are four tracks, so we'd love for you to tell our viewers what's available. And then on April 30th, you'll be hosting an event. Um, and we'd love to hear you talk more about that and what your team is putting together for the community in Brooklyn. Sure. So um, at Mega Evers uh, in 2019, um, President Rudy Crew. Um, gave us full authority. And when I say us, I mean the Cannabis Task Force team at Megger, myself, my mentor and leader, Dr. Chair of the Environmental and Science Department, Dr. Crump, 
and Joel Struthers, an alumni of Mecker, we worked tediously to put together um, educational tracks at Mecker Evers, and we created this cannabis degree minor that has now 13 courses. And so in these 13 courses, you when you divvy them up, there are four tracks. There's the health track, there's the testing and formulations track, there's the commercialization track and the cultivation track. At this time, we are running the second semester. Last semester, we ran the first course, which was intro world of cannabis studies. This semester, we're running the cultivation course, environmental um, cultivation one, as well as business commercialization in cannabis. Um, in the summertime, we will be running environmental cultivation two and probably social health impacts. So these are courses that were created not um, with academicians in a room thinking up ideas. We put these curriculas together and then we went to different industry leaders in these sectors and got their perspective on the curriculas um, because we really wanted these curriculas and these courses to be heavy on the workforce development. So mm -hmm. within them, they're built to make sure that we enhance that 21st century skill set. Um, and really have these students launch and go ready to either expand on their academic performance through graduate studies or through internships or through work. So we've partnered with a lot of different industries to make sure that they're able to help our students catapult from a classroom into work or mm -hmm. internship, et cetera. That's incredible. So thank you for that. And then can you talk to us a little bit about the event coming up at the end of April, I believe, and um, who needs to come and why is it important? So April 30th, we're having an open house for all courses that have been approved. All these courses are degree bearing courses. So, you know, back in the day, I hear some parents used to tell their students, you won't go anywhere with that cannabis. You can't get a degree with that cannabis. Technically, now that's not true. You can um, if you study it, of course, we're talking about studying. Um, and so April 30th, we're having an open house at Medgar Evers College in Brooklyn. We want everyone to come. It's going to be outdoors so that, you know, we're very cautious about the COVID-19 pandemic. And so this is going to be an outdoor event. At that event, we're also going to have different um, companies that are going to be able to exhibit what they have. A lot of companies that usually communities um, out, outside of the cannabis circle don't know of. We want to make sure that our community members and our students are exposed to all this great information. So everyone should go. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I think it's super important that there's courses around cannabis now, because I think that prior to this, a lot of people have a misconception that cannabis is just a drug. And I think that that type of thinking is so out. And I think that it's super important to educate our community and our children and everyone coming up of exactly all of the benefits that cannabis has. And just on the enterprise side, on the medicinal side, and on the growing side, just all of those things can be touched. And so we are super excited to have you leading the way with the education on cannabis and in this um, in this particular sector. And maybe you can just tell us, I guess in your own words, for people who aren't as familiar with the wonderful world of cannabis, why should people care? Why should Black people care? Why should people of color care? Why does this matter to them? Well, I think that once you remove the stigma of cannabis, mm -hmm. anyone that wants to succeed in an industry or partake in any kind of um, cutting edge wealth development should partake in this. I can say if we go back hundreds of years and we speak with Thomas Edison, he was telling people he wanted to take the sun and make it available in everyone's home. So a lot of people were like, oh, he's crazy. This man is crazy, right? But thinking now, some of those people, if they would have partook in either intellectual property or help of development, right now they would have an extreme amount of generational wealth because electricity and a light bulb is used in every home. And so within the cannabis industry, you can be with either plant touching in terms of that industry or ancillary, which has nothing to do with touching this plant, but you can partake in this new market development. And it is an opportunity for yourself as someone who wants to have some kind of either generational wealth or entrepreneurial initiative 
to be able to strongly partake in. And the lack of BIPOC members in this industry is not correct for me and is something that very much upsets me. And so I think it's our duty to make sure that we partake and we help build this system as well. Yeah, I love that. So Vickiana, we've had the privilege of having a few offline conversations with you related to developing the program, um, how special it is to have this program at at MEC within the CUNY system. Um, and just the idea that some of the industry leaders in cannabis um, have taken the taken liberties, right, with social equity, social impact, and there are predatory practices that exist out there. And so again, as we're preparing um, for the open house for, for April 30th, and speaking to our community specifically in the Brooklyn area about what the opportunities are for them in the space. Can you explain a little bit, a little bit about um, what that relationship looks like with the current industry and some of the predatory practices that we're seeing in education and academia um, and why it's important to really ensure that our students are protected? Well, it's really surprising to me to see how initially, well, throughout time, many BIPOC constituents are usually left out of the game. But mm -hmm. now in New York, because of this, um, because of the MRTA and the social equity factors, um, people of color are being more looked at as kind of a prime rib steak on a plate mm -hmm. um, so that they can be in, involved in quote unquote application opportunities. And basically mm -hmm. they're getting taken advantage of. And that's something that needs to be immediately put on blast because it's inappropriate and it's wrong. And one of the ways to prepare uh, these constituents in our communities is to educate them, right? Mm -hmm. So Mega Evers is also, the, the chemistry and environmental science department is also working on putting together like predatorial prep workshops for anyone who wants to partake in those hopefully for the summer or thereafter, um, because it's something that needs to be brought to light. It's inappropriate, it's unacceptable, and mega, the mega Everest team won't stand by it. So on another level, it's important that these predators are aware that there are many people assessing them now and that they wouldn't want to be involved in an academic journal as a form of predatorial practice. They should think about that, and they instead sh should be wanting to be involved as um, industry leaders that want to assist BIPOC members, not take advantage of them. So that also I would love for them to be very aware of. Well, Vickiana, this has been an amazing conversation. We're super excited to see everything that you're going to roll out. If people want to get in touch with you or get involved with some of the things that you are doing, what is the best way for them to contact you or look into some of your work? Um, well, for the site, the MEC Grow site, mecgrow.com, you can definitely go there and they get, they send me all the emails quite often, quite often. So that's like one direct way to really get to me. Um, another way is to contact Brittany Jessica. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. huh? Also Dr. Reed in the environmental and science department. You can request for me with her, or you can speak directly to her. She's also on the next site. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Vickiana, for joining us today. This was a fabulous conversation. We learned so much, and we're really excited for more details on that open house on April 30th. So if you're in the New York area and you're interested in this industry, whether it's in plant touching, on the commercial side, ancillary services, or you just want to learn more about the benefits of the cannabis space, please be sure to reach out to someone at Megra Evers College and we look forward to seeing you at the end of April. Thank you. And thank you for being a woman leading the way. Happy Women's History Month.